Hi, this is Heidi Gaiman from ilovemyshepherd.com. This is Think on These video session number three, What is Justice? We're going to talk about justice today. Uh, we'll talk about some connections with what is uh, fair and what is right and all of those things that kind of float around the topic of justice. Uh, so let's start. Let's talk about first, how do we define it? Let's define just. Uh, if you look at the Greek, uh, it's pronounced dikaia, which is just this concept of just in the eyes of God, which is kind of unique as far as terminology goes, that it is pretty intimately connected, this Greek word, with God's definition of uh, what is just and not just uh, anybody's definition of what is just. It's also connected to uh, the words right, the word fair, um, and also uh, the things associated with rightness and fairness, like righteousness, uh, which we'll talk about in just a minute. So first, let's ask ourselves this question. Uh, I would like to present that we want fair. We all like things fair and we want to some degree to be assured that life is going to be fair uh, even as we tell our children or uh, the younger people the the small uh, people around us uh, by small people I mean children uh, that you know what sometimes life just isn't fair and that's our reality but internally we're like where's the fair I want fair so let's ask ourselves some questions uh, and you can ask these in your groups, too. It would be great to get some feedback. You can write in the comments some of the things you came up with. What do we need to know that will be fair? What would we, when we look around us at the world today, what do we want to know? There will be fair in this someday. We need justice with this thing. Uh, I'll give an example. Uh, when I talk to my youth about it, one of the easiest things for them to understand that justice is important to God, that not just love and grace and mercy and all these kind of positive things that we envision um, that are important to God and, and very important to him, but that justice also does matter, that he is 100% truth and 100% justice while he is 100% mercy and grace. Uh, is both uh, the, just these really, really disturbing, destructive things like murder or child abuse, uh, and particularly uh, sexual abuse of children, sex offenders, uh, youth, and I think all of us want to know that those things are going to be accounted for. That we're, God doesn't just let those things slide. You can't just go around and hurt other people and God ignores it. He's like, whatever, you do what you want. When it comes down to those issues, that is where the rubber hits the road in life. And we, while we don't necessarily want God to really uh, have an opinion, <laughs> these particular things, we're like, okay, where are you, God? We need you to take care of these. These are not okay. And we want to know that he's watching and that it matters to him. So that makes it really complicated. How do we know what, what fair and just is? How do we know what's okay? And it comes back all of these words in Philippians 4 8 come back to that first word in Philippians 4 8, which is truth. And I think you'll see that in the study over and over again if you're working through the, the homework of Think on These, is that every single thing is connected to truth in some way that God cannot be understood or known uh, apart from truth. And that is probably never more so true than in the concept of justice. Because what is it? Well, I mean, who's to say what is right? Who's to say what is wrong? We need to know truth, and God is the one who holds that. And so we read his word and find out. All right, so our first part is about justice's connection to wisdom. Let's look at 2 Kings 3, 16 through 18. And this uh, segment of scripture is about King Solomon and one of the judgments he has to make, uh, a way he, that he brings justice in a particular case. So let's look at 2 Kings 3, 16 
through 28. And I think this is one of those examples and one of the reasons I share it is because it's one of those times where you're like, we need to know that there's going to be justice in this particular example. All right, verse 16. Then two prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. The one woman said, Oh my Lord, this woman and I live in the same house, and I gave birth to a child while she was in the house. Then on the third day after I gave birth, this woman also gave birth, and we were alone. There was no one else with us in the house. Only we two were in the house. And this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him. And she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me while your servant slept and laid him at her breast and laid her dead son at my breast. When I rose in the morning to nurse my child, behold, he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning, behold, he was not the child that I had born. But the other woman said, no, the living child is mine and the dead child is yours. The first said, no, the dead child is yours and the living child is mine. Thus they spoke before the king. Then the king said, the one says, this is my son that is alive and your son is dead. And the other said, no, but your son is dead and my son is living one. And the king said, bring me a sword. It all sounds like Judge Judy, doesn't it? It sounds like a court case that would happen today. Uh, and I think that's kind of important to remember that the Bible has all these examples, all these very real uh, accounts. Uh, we aren't alone in our world with our struggle with justice. Verse 24, and the king said, bring me a sword. So a sword was brought before the king. And the king said, divide the living child in two and give half to the one and half to the other. Then the woman whose son was alive said to the king, because her heart yearned for her son, oh my Lord, give her the living child and by no means put him to death. But the other said, he shall be neither mine nor yours, divide him. Then the king answered and said, give the living child to the first woman, by no means put him to death. She is his mother. And all Israel heard of the judgment that the king had rendered. They stood in awe of the king because they perceived that the wisdom of God was in him to do justice. One very important thing we learned from this uh, is that wisdom is intimately connected to justice. Uh, we cannot have justice without true wisdom. And an important concept in that is that our wisdom is very different from God's. You can read whole passages of scripture about that, that God's wisdom is foolishness uh, to man, or man's wisdom is foolishness to God, that his wisdom is so much greater than ours. So when we do not see God intervene in the way we would like, one thing we need to remind ourselves is that his wisdom is very different. Um, and let's find out more about that. Let's look. First, let's look at Psalm 9. I want you to be encouraged by this passage. Psalm 9, verses 7 through 9, as well as verse 12 in Psalm 9. But the Lord sits enthroned forever, but he has established his throne for justice, and he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the people with rightness. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Verse 12, for he who avenges blood is mindful of them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. So some important things. First, we hear the words justice, we hear righteousness, we hear uprightness. We know those are all connected. That justice and righteousness are something that God is in charge of. That that is his throne. He sits on it. He is the judge. He gets to judge things. We do not. That is his place and his throne. But we also are promised in verse 12, for he who avenges blood is mindful of them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. And in verse 9, he's a stronghold for the oppressed. We can take confidence in the fact that God is at work, that he hears us, and we are invited into relationship with him to bring our concerns for justice to him, to lay them before him and say, God, I want fair here. Please help me understand. Share with me your spirit and your uh, sense of righteous, your sense of just, and help me see. We also need to know that God doesn't answer in the way we've expected sometimes. He doesn't understand justice in the way that we do because his wisdom is bigger and higher and stronger. Let's look at Isaiah 1, 
verses 17, but then also 18. 17 is a pretty common verse that we hear about justice, and it is important. Let's look at it. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. Those things are very important, and God invites us into this kind of history story of seeking justice in our time. We should care about things that aren't just. We should stand up for them, and there's a little bit about that in this week's homework, but God also says in verse 18 that justice might come in a way that we least expected. Let's look. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. God's answer to justice for us is Jesus. In a way that we want fair, we really want things to be fair, God constantly answers everything that we want in life with the person and work of Jesus Christ, our Savior, on the cross and in his resurrection from the tomb. What are we missing for fair? What, uh, what will we miss out on in our relationship from God if we did not let him take care of things? And I think the big answer to that is the word grace. Grace is God's answer to justice very, very often. And he uh, invites us to be a part of that in being able to share grace with the world even when things look very unfair. Uh, let's look at... Uh, Acts 8, and there's a story of someone seeking uh, the answer to justice and then God's way that he kind of reveals himself through another person and through his word. Acts 8, verse 33 through, sorry, Acts 8, verse 30 through 33. I'm actually going to read through 34. I changed my mind. Um, and this is a story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. You can read the larger section if you want, but we're just going to focus on those verses. So Philip ran to him, that's the eunuch, and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet, which we just read, and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? And then Philip has the, the awesome pleasure and responsibility of saying, he's talking about Jesus. Uh, the eunuch, not even knowing it, was seeking Jesus. And uh, Philip was able to reveal to him what and who Jesus was and what he did for him. And I think that that Isaiah passage caught in the middle of there, it's really cool how it says, in his humiliation, justice was denied him. So because Jesus did not get what was fair, we get what is right. Because Jesus did not get what is fair, we get grace instead. It's a beautiful thing. And then how different does life look when we are not busy trying to make everything fair, right? Think about children um, and whether uh, you have some in your house or you're just familiar with children. We all know that children are like, well, he did this and he did that and this isn't fair and this isn't fair. And they have kind of a preoccupation with fair. And we do that as adults too. Uh, we just, I don't think, always recognize it, right? Uh, and so we want to answer children in maybe a creative way to help them see that God didn't design life as fair. And sometimes we just say that, sorry, life isn't fair. Uh, but we also need a dose of that medicine for ourselves, a dose of the truth in the word. And one of my favorite songs uh, is by the band Reliant K and it's called Be My Escape. And I love it for many reasons and I'll put a link in the video notes. But one of the phrases in that song is, the beauty of grace is that it makes life not fair. And that's the way I answer my children and sometimes I have to answer myself too, is that without grace, where would we be? 
that the beauty of grace is that we do not get what is fair. Because Jesus died on the cross, because he rose for us, because he took on the weight of what we deserved on the cross and was humiliated for our sins, we, we don't have to deal with fair. We deal with righteous instead. And Christ gives us that righteousness that has been bestowed on him by the Father um, in who he is as the divine son of God, um, but also as a man who walked around the earth and carried the weight of our sin to that cross for us. It's just a really cool thing. God works almost always in very out-of-the-box ways, in ways we least expected it. And so let's look for ways to share grace in out-of-the-box ways also. I have a challenge question for you today, and that is, where can we think and teach about out-of-the-box fairness? Where can you see it in your own life, the way that grace works in justice and things that you would like to see fair, how God is working in that? And then also how we can kind of share it. How can we teach it? Uh, one thing I think is important is always looking to our out-of-the-box Savior that in any way we can, pointing people, just like Philip did, the Ethiopian eunuch, pointing to the Savior and what he did, that he took that on, that he makes life not fair in a very beautiful way so that we may have grace. And then also remembering that justice is more long-term, that Christ gives us the gift of eternity. And so we are going to see justice in the long term. Christ is coming back for us. It's true. We rejoice in it. Uh, and he promises us that one day all things will be made right. He promises us that uh, when he comes back for us, all the tears will be gone. He will wipe the tears from our eyes and there'll be no more suffering or grief. And that sounds very fair to me. It may not be the way I would like it. It may not help my problem today, but it does make a difference for eternity. And in that, it does make a difference today. So how can we share, think, and teach about out-of-the-box fairness that the beauty of grace is that life is not fair through our Savior Jesus Christ? Thanks for joining me, and I will see you next time.